is a great crowd here tonight. Yeah. How many of y'all are visitors? First time ever here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Tell me how you found out about us. You. My next door neighbor is Rick. I don't even know his last name. He's a member. And my other next door neighbor is Billy Alex. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Billy Adams. <laughs> Welcome. You got you ladies. So oh, look at that. <laughs> Billy Adams, you know. <laughs> That's right. You two. I talked with you at length. Right. Okay. Yes, and you told me you're a big fan of Gary Bowers, like most of the rest of us that know Gary Bowers are. Yes, yeah. So, all right, who else is? Seems like there was somebody else that hadn't been here before. Is that it? Okay. How'd you find out about us? All right, good. Glad you're here. We'll try to completely re educate you to our way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it going to work? It is on. It is not going to work. You guys have messed with my. Oh, oh there it is. Now, now will you work? Yes. If the cursor is on the triangle in the corner, this will work. Okay. All right. We do have a new website. We want you to check it out, nipsotwilco.org. Important thing, if you were subscribed to the blog on the previous site and you want to keep getting our news, you must resubscribe on the new site. We're not just going to pound you um, and just automatically assume you want to. We want to know that you do. And your president and her husband both got caught with the, why aren't we getting blog notifications? So... And, and now we're resubscribed. <laughs> so I did send out a, a, a notice because we had such a fine variety of plants. It looks like we've had some more stuff show up back there. So I kind of advertised that to encourage y'all to come and, you know, give these puppies a home. And uh, anyway, we had volunteer teams working Earth Day. Uh, we had a we bagged up plugs to give away here at the library and the library gave them away. And then we had two teams going out on April 22nd. We had a morning team at Old Settlers Park that was Nancy Pumphrey and Gary Bowers handing out plants. And that was a big, big success. And then we had an afternoon team of Vicki Husband and Susie Hickman and Marsha Whitkey. Yeah. Giving out at Gary Park. So. In fact, somebody else, never mind. You don't want to hear that. Especially the YouTubers don't. So, but anyway, they we had a big crew that went out and to uh, Nancy's and put the plugs in bags. We put a nice label on there that tells what the plant is, how to take care of it, and then of course all of our contact information. So how you can look us up and get smarter about native plants. All right, and there's some pictures. That is the Gary Park booth. Um, the plant giveaways are very popular. All right, this is our field trip agenda for the next, uh, all the way to October. That'll go away in the middle, those of you that are in here. So anyway, you get the point. You've got Tejas Camp and has that already been posted on the blog? Yes, it has. That information has been posted on the blog. So if you're not resubscribed, go to the website, look at the blog and find out about uh, Tejas Camp. And I don't know if Murphy Park's been posted. No, the rest of them have, okay. Okay, and you will notice as, you know, 9 a.m., 9 a.m., 8 a.m. for the Hidden Springs Plant Survey. So, and then in September, we're gonna go to San Antonio Botanical Garden. That's back up at 10 o'clock. And then we get down in the cold season and it's 2.30 in the afternoon. So we try to cover the night owls and the early birds to make them feel welcome at our field trips. 
our field trips are fantastic. We have people like Gary Bowers and we have several other people that are just as knowledgeable or as he is and they're on our field trip so you can get everything identified. One of the things I don't have a slide on, what we do have, and it's really going gangbusters, is our plant rescue efforts. Don't think Ashley's in here tonight, but uh, uh, Ashley Landry leads our uh, plant rescue project and uh, even the uh, Wilco County Roads has kind of joined up with us and you know, there we did a rescue there. Uh, last week's and they gave us really good PR for doing so. So we appreciate that. But that's a good way to get free plants. You do have to be a member of the Native Plant Society for liability insurance's purposes. And she's really good about keeping the landowners and so forth, you know, making sure that is. So whatever you pay for your Native Plant Society dues, you're getting that much in free plants in one, one dig. You know, because you can take them home with you or you can put them wherever you want to. Just get them out from under the concrete to be. Uh-oh, I moved it. Technical issues. Okay. These are the plants that are listed in the back of the room. And I think I saw that Elsa, what did you bring in? Oh, she's busy. Hey, Elsa and Randy. Elsa, what plants did you bring us? There you go. Some more stuff. And then I don't know how much of each of these are left. I know that there's quite a bit of uh, Maximilian sunflower back there. So if you've got a, a hankering to feed uh, monarchs this summer and fall. <laughs> The Mexican hat foliage is considerably different from the Maximilian sunflower. And there's one Maximilian back there flowering. So, you know, they were free. So, you know. Okay. All right. Pollinator wildflower. And then uh, Mark brought in some of the cool stuff over here uh, from his propagation and digging. This is what the um, programs look like from June the 8th to November. And I could not remember, Susie, if we got somebody for October. Huh? Oh, that's right. Ashley Landry, our plant rescue person, is speaking in October. That was pretty important for me to forget. Okay. Notice that the August meeting is at the Georgetown Parks and Recreation Building. And the so is the September meeting. There's things going on here with the library, new carpet, stuff competition for rooms, et cetera. And Nancy Copperman has done an exhaustive job looking for us alternatives for alternative places that have the media and the, um, you know, the internet and that kind of stuff that we need for a meeting. So that's where we are. That building is um, in Georgetown and on the east side of San Gabriel Park over the big fancy bridge. So, but that's their headquarters, the buildings down there on the end. It is pretty dark up in there, but we sh should be still on good daylight savings time in August and September. So. Somebody tonight, if you've got a blue ticket, and be sure you get a blue ticket, we'll draw after the meeting, will win a free copy of Ricky's book, uh, Range Plants of North Central Texas. This is a fabulous, fabulous book, y'all. It's one of my favorites because when I'm Working on uh, native plant sale signs that we have back there that you know have come through morphed through designs and you know Randy ramrods that we um, there's details in his books about plants that you don't get anywhere else. He just he tells you about the plant like it's almost like it's neighbors. You know what eats it, what doesn't eat it, when to take your livestock off of it. You know little just little tidbits of stuff. It's so interesting and it makes the information that we can give to you that much richer. And if you don't win it tonight, it was only available and no longer in print at your NRCS office, maybe. 
but uh, the Botanical Research Institute of Texas, known as BRIT in Fort Worth, has picked it up and reprinted it. So you may now order it for $35 from BRIT. So it's no longer languishing and obscure. So. And I have moved it again. I can see this is going to be a problem, Ricky. All right. This is all about us. This is our YouTube channel. If you go to our nips.wilco.org, you will be able to access the YouTube channel. You just click on the links and go to it. I was advertising, last time Ricky spoke to us, he talked about why streams do what they do. It's one of the best water presentations I have ever seen. And I have gone back to it over and over, my own self preparing water presentations and water conservation presentations. Not so much the diagrams about what the stream does to the land, just all the other information. It's fabulous. I highly recommend that you go watch it. And here's our information on meetings and how to join. I've doubled up on the font size here on always take note of the location of the meeting because we have those two meetings at Georgetown Parks and Recreation. But if I'm not mistaken, we have a couple of other meetings. Is that right, Nancy, that are kind of yeah yeah november is inventory so we are kind of you know we're not homeless we're just kind of Tra traveling <laughs> so, all right okay time for our speaker this is ricky in his native habitat here, out in a prairie in a field, and holding a holding a native plant, his cap on. So, um, but this is all about him. He's retired from the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and you can see he's wildlife biologist. Was probably still gets calls, don't you? People that know what you do, farmers and ranchers don't ever stop. They don't let you go. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, well, welcome Ricky Lennox. So we're gonna talk about the uh, medicinal application of native plants by Native Americans. I had photos from the rolling plains. Somewhere in that photo, there are plants that are used by Native Americans. The mesquite is one, others. But we've, over the last couple of hundred years, a lot of times we've forgotten about those plants. When modern medicine came out, it was easier just to open up the pill bottle and take that pill for your eels. But the Native Americans, most of them did not forget. They still have that information. Here's a map of the United States with all the tribes spread out and there are hundreds of tribes. Uh, the ones on the left, I'm gonna kind of reference some of the uses of the plants for these tribes that were close, close to us. And sometimes they're not close, but it's an interesting use. And Melissa Sturdivant was an employee with NRCS. She's now a tribal relations specialist with USDA Rural Development, working out of Coleman, but in their national office and works 12 or more Western states now um, as a tribal relation, uh, relations specialist. She's also a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. And she gave me this quote, and there's that little box that keeps popping up. And when I'm sitting at home doing a Zoom, that little box pops up too. But I may have learned from Beth how to get rid of it for a minute or two. But Chief Crowfoot, what is life? It is the flash of a firefly in the night. It's the breath of a buffalo in the wintertime. It's a little shadow that runs across the grass and loses itself in the sunset. And I took that photo out south of Alpine several years ago, and that shadow running across the land sort of ties in with that quote. And to tie in Melissa to this, uh, some of those plants I, I noticed that I needed, a, it would benefit the, the quote if it was a Native American quote. And I asked Melissa to find me some quotes that fit these plants and she did. And I went back and asked her several times to find another plant, I mean, another quote. This gentleman here is, was born almost 200 years ago, but he was a wise man, a chief. Many of those chiefs, I'm, I'm sure they were all wise men, but. Uh, it just makes us, you know, think about the relationship that the Native Americans had with the plants that they used as food for medicine and the use of the wildlife that used the plants. They needed the wildlife, so they had to manage the plants. 
and the habitats that they lived in. And it was a circle that, you know, never failed the, the Native Americans. We kind of came in and messed it up a little bit. I may have moved it off that. All right, we'll do it this way. Well, let's get some definitions out of the way first, because I'm going to reference these. Uh, and in the uh, information, you if you research this, you'll start seeing things like washes, decoctions, tinctures, poultice. So a wash is just a liquid medicinal preparation used for cleansing, eye wash, mouth wash. They mixed a plant with water and used it for cleaning. Pretty simple. An infusion, we think of nowadays, that would be a needle going in your hand hooked to a bottle or a bag now, I guess, with some sort of fluid in it. But in their days, they didn't have uh, IVs or, or shots. So an infusion to them was like a tea. So it's a hot water extract of the herbs through steeping and used as a herbal tea. So if you see infusion, think of tea. A decoction, long-term boiled extracts using the roots or bark. So they're putting it in water and boiling it, condensing it, you know, thickening it up, making it stronger and getting the better part of those plants out of the roots and the bark. Now tincture, they use this as a concentrated, uh, they soak the berries, bark, leaves, roots from one or more plants in alcohol or vinegar. And the vinegar or alcohol pulled out the active ingredients in the plant parts, concentrating them as a liquid. So you wouldn't have to take as much of a tincture. It'd be, you know, just a, maybe a few ounces would probably cure you of whatever was ailing you. And then a poultice. It's a paste made of herbs, plants, and other substances with healing properties, thought to have healing properties. Spread on a warm, moist cloth and applied to the body to relieve inflammation and promote healing. That movie, uh, Josie, the outlaw Josie Wells, when they're about to cross that ferry and Granny's sitting on the porch and Josie Wells' companion has been shot, she said, I've got a poultice for that bullet wound. Mind you keep a few drops of water on that poultice. So poultices were used by settlers as well as the Native Americans. and. Uh, they could get pretty ingenious with what they were using to wrap that medicine in, what, what was the outer part of that poultice. Now, I'm going to show you distribution maps of these plants. Now, Texas does not have a state flora, which would list the, dist would list the counties where these plants are found. So when uh, the USDA plants database is one site, you can go and get distribution maps. This is from a site called BONAP, and it is a uh, Biota of North America program, but you can just Google B-O-N-A-P and it will come up. Look on the left side and there'll be a, a several little hot links, but you want to look for the county distribution map, county level distribution. That's what it's showing, the state and then individual counties. And so for Texas, the way they did this is they since we didn't have a flora, they emailed all of the herbariums, universities, private, like Brit, uh, and said, can you send us a list of the plants you have that's been collected and submitted to you over the years and what county that plant came from? So it's a massive database that they'll build, and that's, that's how they get these counties show up in light green. So a county, if you look at uh, New Mexico, it's that tan color down in the lower left. It says species not present in state, so it's it's absent. In green, uh, the upper left, right, I don't know where the pointer is, no. I was trying to use the pointer, there it is. So the uh, that upper green state color key is the dark green, meaning it's present somewhere in that state. And then the light green to the right of that, species present, and not considered rare. So this is not 100% active. It'll get you in the ballpark because there may be a plant uh, just east of Bell County that you know is there, Cytostroma or something. 
you know it's there, you've seen it, but it doesn't show up here. What that means is someone has not collected that plant and submitted it to a herbarium, so it's not in the database. But it gets you in the ballpark. And we'll see a couple of plants that are yellow. So the yellow is species present, but considered rare. And then right to the right of it, the pinkish color is a noxious plant. So we'll see a couple of those. Now my up and down areas are not working. Get back over there and see. There we go. There's the bone app I was trying to get to come up. So we're going to jump into the very first plant, Indian plantain, appropriate name plant for a Native American medicinal use presentation. The Cherokee made a poultice for cuts, bruises, tumors. I don't know about a tumor treatment, but I think it would work for the cuts, bruises, and infections. And this plant has got, you can see in those leaves, very deeply pronounced veins. Uh, it's about 24, 30 inches tall. Here's where it can be found in Texas, about the eastern half of the state. And notice also up in Oklahoma and Kansas, it's on the eastern side. So this plant is uh, an eastern plant from all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. We're on the western edge of its adaptation. The flowers are on the left. The developing seeds are on the right. And you may see Indian plantain. It's a very fleshy leaf. I think you'll notice it that it's something different. Now here's a Rocky Mountain bee plant, only found in about five counties in Texas. And I took this photo and we found it up in the panhandle of Texas, up in uh, Roberts County. Well, Pampa, right about right there. And, but it's, it's also, look at the name, Rocky Mountain bee plant. So it's common to the Western states. So we're on the eastern edge of its range. Texas is kind of in the overlap of a lot of these plants. But it was used as a treatment for anemia, insect bites, stomach disorders, and the plant was eaten by the Pueblo tribe. Now, if you look at those seed pods hanging down, when they were dry, they could gather them, pound them into a flour, and mix it with some fat and make a, a bread. Or they could take the green leaves, mix you know, cook it in water with a little grease and make black greens. But they could also take the juice if you had an insect bite. So what you were cooking for supper, the, ju the juice of that could be used to treat that insect bite. And on that photo on the right, look at the plant with the orange flowers. That's narrow leaf globe mallow. We're gonna see it again. So right in that one photo, there's two plants that the Native Americans could have used for medicinal uses. And again, look at the big picture map of uh, the distribution. It just barely comes into Texas, but all of the Western states, it's, it's commonly found. And this is, um, get me here. wild licorice. Again, from the Panhandle of Texas in that same location up in the Pampa area. This was on a tributary of the Canadian River. Um, again, Texas is on the south uh, east corner of where it can grow. It has uh, unique looking seed pods. They are very trying to hit that sweet spot where that mouse will work again. There we go. Um, they look like little cuckleburrs. They're about half size cucklebur. The tea of the peeled and dried roots or leaves used to treat diarrhea or upset stomach. What do we have now for that? Streptobismol. Root chewed and helped in the mouth for toothache. Tea made of the roots for cough, chest pain, sore throat, and root boiled in water to make a tea drunk to speed delivery of the placenta. And leaves steeped in water used for earache. So a lot of uses of that one plant. Now that little half-sized cucumber seed does have Velcro hooks. The pod does, the seeds are inside it. 
and they would get attached to the hair of animals, buffalo. Buffalo might go 20 miles and roll in a buffalo wallow and drop those seeds off. Now the plant has got wider distribution, which is beneficial for those Native Americans at the time because they could find the buffalo and the plant nearby. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, uh, that, that's a photo I found on the Ladybird Johnson wildflower site, but up there in the panhandle, it grows in deep sand. Uh, but in the where it can grow, I think varies, because you look at all those Western states, it's in the mountains, It's it's gotta be in some rock too. Um, here's one, Rattlesnake Master, might come within a couple of counties of here. If you've got it, you, you're, it's a blessing to have it. Uh, Cherokee made a tincture, you know, using the alcohol and vinegar to extract the, the goodness to treat a European disease brought in by the settlers, whooping cough, used as a snake bite treatment by many tribes, giving it that name. And again, we're on the Eastern side of where it's adapted. The leaves have got those really long, uh, sharp pointed teeth. Here's the uh, flowers after they start maturing, they're not all that showy, but on the right hand side is one that's fairly, it's still green in the stem, so it's not after frost, but it's matured. And you could probably just about get seed off of that. And that photo in the middle is from the Ladybird site, again, with a kind of a foggy sunrise. Frostweed, frostweed, comes under every oak tree. If you buy land with oaks, you get frostweed as a bonus. Am I telling the truth? It's pretty well works out to be that way. But frostweed um, is a great pollinator plant as well. The leaves were dried, used as a substitute for tobacco by many tribes. Choctaw used a cold tea of pounded roots during attacks of fever. And the Chickasha used it as a deobstruct, uh, opening pores, opening the ducts. Um, frostweed is its claim to fame, though, is in the fall, the first light frost you have, there's a lot of sap in that stem, and the stem will, will split open because the sap freezes and it exudes out in frost ribbons, and it'll melt within a couple of hours. Now, if it was just a light frost, it doesn't kill the plant. And if there's moisture in the soil, it'll pick up more moisture, make sap again. You have another frost in a week or 10 days, it'll, it'll split the stems and do it again. Uh, very easy to grow. Cattle don't eat it. Deer won't eat it. So that's a good pollinator plant in the fall. Mayapple. This is a low growing plant, a little bit east of where we are. Uh, look at where it's growing there in the uh, eastern fourth of the state. The roots used as a strong purgative by the Eastern tribes. Again, it's all the way to the East Coast. Cherokee used a drop of juice of the fresh root put in the ear to treat deafness. Maybe just need your ears cleaned out. Root ooze used to soak corn before planting to keep crows off insects. Now that's a unique use, but it might be because while the fruit that you can see down there in the lower right, that yellow custard making fruit is edible, the leaves, the stems, the flowers, the roots will kill you. So, but those little short plants in the left photo that are about a foot tall, that's all may apple. Spanish moss. We're just a little north of where it's commonly found, but you go down to San Antonio, you're gonna find a lot of it. From the Civil War and probably before, used as a dressing for wounds. You need something to stop the flow of blood, this was available. You know, wrap, wrap an old bandana or something around that and use it as a dressing. Apparently with no ill effects. It was not something that got people, uh, made the wound infected or anything. How about this? It, it looks like somebody unspooled a fishing reel, a monofilament line out there. 
This is Dodder, it is native. Um, the Cherokee used a poultice of the crushed stems to treat bruises and inflammation. Now this plant comes and goes. Some years you have it, some years you don't. It's just, you never know, depending on the rainfall, I guess. It's semi-parasitic, so it's living off some of the roots of other plants. Notice the states to the east and west of us, they consider it noxious, but Texas and Oklahoma just considers it a native plant. Illinois bundle flower. This is one of our premier wildlife plants. Easy to grow. You can buy the seed of it. Very inexpensive seed. Uh, Pawnee used a leaf tea wash for skin irritations. Uh, deer, cattle eat the leaves. Game birds, songbirds eat the seeds that it produces. Pollinator plant early in the year. And it grows across most of Texas, except for deep south Texas. But another good, solid native plant. White trout lily, fawn lily. This is a, uh, I thought, before I looked at the distribution map, I'd always heard that it was sort of rare, but I've only seen it one time and it was on Cedar Hill Nature Area in Southwest Dallas County. I've seen the leaves several times, but only seen the flowers once. You have to be out there uh, probably late, around March to see them. Um, but if you don't see the flowers, you can look for those leaves. They've got those spots like a trout. But look at the distribution map. It shows it has been found up and down the Blackland Prairie, pretty much all the way. Uh, a little bit into the Post Oak Savannah and a few counties over into the Piney Woods. This is 10 petal mint zilia. Um, it's got another name up here, I think. Let's see what it is. Sand lily. Yeah. And it also often has 10 petals. So that's where it gets the name 10 petal mint zilia. Uh, all species, and there's several mint zilias, uh, were used by native tribes, the Cheyenne, Dakota, Zuni, used the bald strain sap applied externally for fever, the gummy juice and roots to treat fevers, arthritis, smallpox, and other illnesses. Now these leaves will stick to you like Velcro. And if you try to get it off your pants while they're green, it, it'll just tear apart. But let the, pants, let the plant dry for a day or two on your pants, take a knife and you just scrape it right off. You'll have a hard time getting it off while it's green. And look at where it grows in the panhandle. So it's high plains, rolling plains, drops down into uh, Eastern Edwards Plateau, a little bit of the coastal prairie, a little bit of South Texas too. Here's the close-up of the, uh, the flower and the fruit, the seed pods, or that spider looking uh, thing on the right-hand side with the, the legs, that's the actual fruit of sand lily. Here's another mint zilia called stick leaf. It also goes by the name of chick thief. Um, and look at where it grows. It's pretty well everywhere in Texas, except for the piney woods. Um, again, all parts will stick to you, except for the flower. And it likes to grow in sort of disturbed areas. It's on a little pile of gravel right there that was pushed up. So again, though, all the distribution, look at, it's going up into the Great Plains, probably goes all the way to Canada. So the tribes in the Great Plains would have made a lot of use of this plant. White prickly poppy, tea made from the seed used as a purgative and uh, the tea given for colic and headache. So they would boil the plant down. Now the stem, if you damage the stem, it, it's got a yellow dye that just seeps out, yellow sap. Um, and many a quail hunter has been scared by this plant because in the fall, when those seed pods mature, they're held up like a vase and the seeds are loose and they rattle around. So when you brush against it, it sounds just like a rattlesnake rattling. So they have jumped many a time. Gay feather or liatris, whatever you want to call it. The corms were used as a treatment of sore throat and snake bite, giving it another name of button snake root. And that photo in the middle of the narrow leaf gay feather, that plant. That's a road cut on a ranch road in Coleman County. It's a healthy plant, but look how much root is exposed on both of those gay feathers. 
Well, if I found a, a graph that showed plant roots in an old Phillips 66 book on forage and range plants, and those roots can go down 15, 16 feet. So even though some of the roots exposed, there's still roots going in the bank. And if you dig one up and it's got a carrot-like corm, like we see on narrow leaf, that is narrow leaf. But if you dig one up and it's got an onion-shaped root, like the one on the left, that's dotted gay feather. And dotted gay feather is more common west of here, but narrow leaf would be up and down central Texas. And I, I believe that map on the uh, distribution map is a composite composite map of several gay feathers. But looking looking at the area, it likes to grow in Texas, going over just about every every region. You cut that corm open. This is dotted gay feather cut open. It has a purplish. I've seen them solid purple. This one had a white center. Um, and it looks like an onion, but it's called a corn. It's not an onion. And it doesn't taste very good. Uh, this is uh, woolly ironweed on the left. Sorry, you can't see that name. And Baldwin's ironweed on the right. The broader leaf is Baldwin's ironweed. Uh, roots were used to purify the blood to reduce fevers as an aphrodisiac and snake back care. Cherokee used a root tea of one species to prevent pregnancy, relieve pain of afterbirth, and treat stomach ulcers. And then the Natchez used decoction of the whole plant for dysentery. And both of these plants could be found right here in Bell County. Look at where they grow. Prairie spiderwort. Now, the Dakota use this plant as a love charm while singing. And I got to thinking, those young bucks, they've got this plant figured out. Because spiderwort always has three petals. She loves me, she loves me not, she loves me. <laughs> so they used it to their advantage when they were courting. And I think there's more, there is more than one species of spiderwort. And I think this is another composite map of several spiderworts, but it is a beautiful plant, um, grows, late it starts growth late in the winter the navajo made a cold tea of the root internally and externally for deer infection and i looked this up and this was deer fever tick fever which we know now is lyme disease so they had it too and they didn't have the medicines that we have but they used spiderwort as a, as a tea of the root purple prairie clover uh, one of our Beautiful native lagoons. Um, move that where I can read what who was using it. Various plains tribes used this, and it was said to be strongly antibacterial plant to heal heart problems, measles, pneumonia, and as, and as a general preventative. So this might have been the elderberry that we talk about so much now. Elderberry syrup, or you take as a preventative. This may have been what they used. And the distribution map does not show where it grows in Texas. It grows in a lot more counties than what this shows. But you just have to take the distribution map with a grain of salt. Look at where it grows, though, in the Great Plains, eastern Rocky Mountains, down in the flatlands. So it was widely spread. And lots of tribes would have used it. And I cut it off on the east, but it's going across the Mississippi and keeps going. Wild bergamot. One of the Minardas, Cherokee and Akawa used to uh, treat heart ailments, I believe, insect bites. The Apache, Hopi, and Tiwa used it as a seasoning and to preserve meats. The Blackfoot used poultice of the plants, uh, uh, plant pieces applied to cuts. Now, all parts of this plant have a very citrusy smell. It's a unique plant. First saw it in Parker County. Up by Weatherford, uh, one of our employees, Juliet Carter, showed it, showed me pictures of it that were, she had found it on their property. And I got some seed from her and, and grew it. And the only negative I can say for it is you get one flower per stem per year. Even if you cut that dried head off, it doesn't reproduce anymore. But it's beautiful. And look at where it grows in Texas. We got a gap in the High Plains, Rolling Plains, Edwards Plateau where it doesn't show up so much. East of us, it's present. West of us, it's present. It's just a little bit of a gap. Look at look at that area. Look where it's all the way up into Maine. 
you know, it's, it's just a little bit of a dry spot right here in the middle part of the Southern Plains. Look at all the hairs on those flowers up close and those little pollinators visiting the plant. What I want to call your attention to now inside of that yellow circle, that's the ripening seeds. After the flowers have been pollinated, the flower falls away, the seed pod is left to begin growth. And on the left is that same part that's in the yellow circle after it dries and I pulled it off the plant. And I got to looking under a microscope and I was saying, what is that little red stuff I'm seeing? It looks like rubies. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the purpose is, but it, under magnification with a little light on it, they shine like rubies. Yeah, Some sort of gland, yeah. But the seeds are so tiny, about all you can do is just crush that up and plant the seed and the chaff. You can't separate the seed, even with sieves, you can't separate the seed out. All of the different salvias would have been used by many tribes. Again, this one's on the western, we're in the western edge of its range. Cherokee used an infusion, a tea taken to check the bowels, colds, cough, laxative. So it checked bowels or be used as laxative, so it could go either way, couldn't it? And a syrup of the leaves and honey taken for asthma. So they had to wait till the settlers brought in the European honeybee to get the honey but they soon learned what honey was. We're gonna go down on a riparian area and look at the plants. Well, this water hyssop right here, let's look at it up close. Uh, it lays on the ground, doesn't get more than four or five inches tall. And it's got above ground stolons that run across the ground and help hold the soil and trap sediment. Long used medicinally for asthma, improving blood clotting and helping your memory. And look at where it grows, the Southern half of the state. Up there in uh, southeastern Oklahoma, there's one county it shows up in yellow, meaning it's present in the state, but rare. So maybe they found one plant years ago. Silverleaf nightshade, which is a weed. I hate to call a native plant a weed, but it is. You ask any cotton farmer, it's a weed. Um, but in England, they prize it as a flower garden plant from the United States. Look at those flowers. The yellow stamens, anthers, bluish purple flowers, beautiful plant, but it's a weed. The ripe berries used by Southwest tribes in making cheese from goat's milk. Berries were also used in treating sore throat and toothache. Uh, Zunis used the beverage mixed with curdled goat milk and considered it a delicious beverage. But it, it's also, those berries are also poisonous. So you have to know how much is needed and what's good and what's not. Now the states around us, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Kansas, Arkansas, Louisiana, they're considering it a noxious plant. Texas hasn't just labeled it as such. Yarrow, the crushed fresh leaves stop bleeding in a poultice and relieves rashes. This is a common plant. You can see it out in the pastures. Other plant parts help stop internal bleeding and serve as a local anesthetic used by many tribes. So there's a good plant, good uses. It can be found right here in this part of the state. Again, I think it's more common than what the distribution maps reflect. Uh, it's in the panhandle, rolling plains. Broom snakeweed, perennial broom weed, also called turpentine weed. And the Navajo used it to treat snake bite, given, giving it the name snakeweed. A decoction of the fresh flowers or fresh roots taken for diarrhea. And this will be, if you find this in Bell County, it's going to either be on a rocky little outcropping like that or a tight clay outcropping. Out in West Texas, they have a lot of those type locations and that's where it's going to be found. It can grow in just regular locations out there. But on the east side of the zone, you've got to look for it in kind of an outcropping area. Regular common sunflower, annual sunflower. A poultice of the flowers was used for burns. The crushed root applied as a mash to draw a blister. You know, a lot of times we look for something to pull a blister out. That may be something you want to try. Crush the root up and apply it as a mash. Maybe make a poultice and put it on that blister. The roots chewed and applied to swollen area of rattlesnake bites after the venom was sucked out. And American Indians used a flower tea for lung ailments. 
malaria, a leaf tea for high fevers, and astringent poultice on snake bites and spider bites. And they say that they, they have documented through ancient writings and stories that there's over 3,000 years of use by the Plains Indians. So it was very commonly used and Texas now is gonna call it noxious while all, all the other states don't. Here's one that you have back there on the table. You can get a sample and get a start. Maximilian sunflower, the rhizomes were eaten by Sioux and other Western tribes and it does spread by seed and rhizomes. So it gets larger. Early pioneers uh, grew, their, grew this plant near their homes, whether it was a cabin, a dugout or whatever, to repel mosquitoes. And you can take the blossoms in the fall and put them in bath water to relieve arthritis pain. But probably the number one use of this plant is, let me go back, look at where it's found commonly, right in the middle part of the state. And when does it flower? In the fall, when the monarchs are coming south. So right along that flyway is where Maximilian is. Um, and everywhere a leaf comes off that stem, there will be a flower. So it's a beautiful plant reflecting autumn sunshine back up to those monarchs. Come down here, it's like a Bucky's. Come down, fill your gas tank up. It's not just six pumps, it's you know 200 pumps there. So there's if you can find a few acres of that, the monarchs will certainly use it. Mexican hat, prairie cone flower, used by many tribes. Shine called it rattlesnake medicine. Uh, decoction of the leaves and stems used for general pain and poison ivy rash. Lakota made a tea of the plant tops to cure abdominal pain and relieve headaches. This plant is not eaten by any animal. So if you have a pasture that's overgrazed, this is going to be probably the dominant plant out there because it's going to be the most common plant. And in parts of the Edwards Plateau, it is the most common plant on rangeland because it's just it's the survivor. Brown-eyed Susan, one of the rubecchias, Cherokee used the juice from the roots for earache, a tea made from the dried leaves and flowers. And again, it kind of skips over the western half of the state, but it's found, it can be found around here. And this photo on the upper right, I found on the Plants Database website, USDA Plants Database, and they cut that flower in half and you can see the developing seeds down at the bottom of brown seeds and the newer, younger seeds developing up near the, the top. Golden crown beard, also called cow pen daisy. Some people may call this a weed, but as long as you have moisture, rain, you'll have cow pen daisy. It likes to grow. It does, it's an annual, so it's got to have the moisture and it can flower from spring till frost, if you have the moisture. Many tribes used it for treating balls, skin diseases, stomach cramps, spider bites, the big leaves with the teeth on the margins, really easy to, to spot it. This is a photo I took in Mills County under some live oaks that had died with live oak wilt. They died in the year since we'd been out there. And I wanna, now I've walked up, let me back up. Just to the left, on the left side of the photo, that's about where this next photo is gonna start. So if you see the shadows on the ground to the left, that's the live oaks, they're still alive, still have leaves. To the right is where the trees died. I'm gonna start this video and watch as we go to the right. Nothing's been done. The old dead limbs are still there, but where did those plants come from? The seeds were there. Waiting on an opportunity. Look at the, there's monarchs and queens nectaring there. This was in September. Um, just the seeds, no telling how long they had been there, waiting for a chance to grow. So with the dead trees, not using the moisture and sunlight hitting the ground, those seeds germinated. And they were used by the monarchs going south that year. I went back Year after year, I went back in the fall and looked. I was out there in July of 20 when COVID was going on. I followed the rancher and asked him if I could go out there. I was getting stir crazy. And they said, yeah. And right there where that had been, 
Texas wintergrass had taken it over. So this, the seeds are there, but they're gonna have to wait for their chance again down the road. Narrowleaf pacoon, also called fringe pacoon. Navajos chewed the root for coughs and colds. Many tribes used the roots for a reddish dye. And the Blackfeet burned the dried tops as incense during ceremonies. Now these flowers are real showy, but they're all show and no go. And what I mean by that, they're sterile. Why would a plant put that much energy into a flower that's not gonna do anything? We don't know. But about a month after those bright yellow flowers wither away, small little uh, greenish white flowers, and this is the developing seed right up here, but small little greenish white flowers will form in the leaf axles. And those are the ones that don't have a lot of show, but they produce the goat, they produce the seeds. And those seeds, when you look at them in the crop of a quail that's been eating seeds, it's one of the few white seeds that we have out there in nature. And it looks like a shiny knight's helmet. But look at where Pacoon grows everywhere in Texas, except over in the deepest shade of the Piney Woods. But all the other counties, it's been well documented. It's a pretty plant, so it's been collected, gets turned in. Here's that narrowly globe mallow that we saw with the, uh, I can't remember the name of that first plant. But anyway, we saw it early. The roots used by many Western tribes for coughs, cold remedy. Pima used the stomach used it for stomach issues and as an anti-diarrhea. Tiwa applied a poultice of pulverized roots to purulent sores and snake bite. I had to look up what a purulent sore, that's a pus filled sore. So a bad sore. And look at where it grows, kind of the western half of the state, a couple of three counties on the eastern half. Um, it has different color variations. Not really depending on the soil, it's just, it's the same plant, but it can have different colors. Desert holly, for the West Texas uh, landowners, you see this plant as a six to eight inch tall holly looking plant with holly leaves, holly like leaves. A decoction of the entire plant, while toxic, was used medicinally. And in Mexico, they make a rat poison out of it. So a little bit will help you, a little too much might put you underground. Six to eight inches tall. And wine cup, we've got an annual wine cup, perennial wine cup. Lakota used a decoction of the root taken for internal pains. Smoke of the dried root used to bathe aching body parts. So they throw the plant into the fire and then put your elbow over the, in the smoke. Root smoke from the root inhaled for head cold. Osage and other tribes cooked and ate the sweet starchy root. So you can dig up that perennial root and actually eat it today. And down here in the lower middle of that middle photo is the uh, developing seed, kind of grows in a circle. That's the flowers withering away and the seeds developing. Again, kind of in the middle two thirds of the states where it's found. Let's talk about a few trees now. Ephedra or Mormon's tea, another common name. The scientific name, Ephedra anti-syphilitica. Anti-syphilitica. Maybe anti-syphilis. Oh yeah, the Pima. Pima used it for treating syphilis. An infusion of the stems and water. So they just broke those stems off and heated it up with a little water. Tiwa chewed the leaves and stems and or a decoction taken for diarrhea. Now, if you're out in a pasture and you happen to have the diarrhea problem, that might be good information to know. Chew some of the stems. We're gonna come back and talk about this in just a minute. Because look at where um, ephedra anti-syphilitica is found. Texas, New Mexico, but not Arizona. Here's the way it looks. It, it has no leaves, it just has green stems. It is browsed by livestock and deer. The flowers on the right show up in April. The seeds in the middle photo are brown football shaped seeds with three fleshy pinkish husks uh, around it. And they're formed in May. So if you wanna harvest some seed, you need to find the plant right now and start 
looking to see if it's got seed on it, maybe later in May before they're formed. Now let's go back to that ephedra antisyphilitica, Mormon's tea. So I think this is the plant that actually was used by the Pima and the Mormons because Arizona and Utah, again, does not have the antisyphilitica species. If you look down in this plants, uh, plant guide, some of the alternative names is Mormon tea and joint verb. So this is the one that actually was used to treat syphilis, but ours got the name. So that and dollar and a half might get you a cup of coffee in some cafes. Arizona black walnut on private ponds, you can do this. You can't do it in creeks or rivers that's considered public waters. You can take these green husk of the developing walnuts, put them in a toe sack or a bucket, crush them up, throw them out in this little pond and it will kill fish. So you can go fishing without a fishing pole. Can't do it in public waters though. It, it acts like rotenum. It just suffocates the, the uh, gills of the fish. And the nut, Meat was mixed with mezcal, soto, or mesquite and used as food. And look at where it grows, the Eastern Edwards Plateau, I'd say Southern Blackland Prairie, cross timbers. And this photo was taken in Mills County, Gothwaite area, growing on a pretty steep slope. You know, that's almost 45 degree slope. That's a big mountain too, about 600 foot. In Central Texas, that's a mountain. And what do you know? What do you do if you think you might have stumbled on a black walnut? And how do you tell it from a pecan? The pecan, if you crush the leaf and smell of it, it smells like a green husk pecan. The leaf of walnut will not smell like that. It really doesn't have much smell at all. But take a pencil size or slightly larger limb and cut it at a steep angle to where you can see the pith. And if the pith is stacked in little cells like poker chips, that is a walnut. Little leaf sumac, we're getting into several of the sumacs here. Little leaf, the Comanche chewed the bark, swallowed the juice for treating colds. So you could grab, you know, a, a limb while you was horseback running from the cavalry. If you had a cold, you could chew it and just keep running. California, the Indians of Round Valley applied the dried powdered berries to smallpox sores and other European disease. Rama Navajo had many uses. They use the leaves to cause impotency as a form of birth control and also use the bark to help expel the placenta during childbirth. So they could work magic either way, apparently. The western half of the state, where it's more commonly found, really common in the Edwards Plateau, the southern uh, panhandle. Here's a close up look of the leaf, of a little leaf. It's got the little berries there, the little hairy berries. Here's evergreen sumac, which is a lot like our live oak, has leaves 11 months out of the year till they drop the leaves and put the new set on. But the dried leaves were mixed with tobacco to make tobacco go further for smoking. Leaves used as a treatment for asthma. And the red fruits were steeped in water to make a refreshing drink. This one comes over probably into the western part of Bell County, the rougher hill country looking part of the county. And then southern Edwards Plateau, it's also little ways probably up to the Colorado River and then out in the Big Bend region. Skunk bush sumac is a more common one around here and this is more common than what it shows as well. Um, the Cheyenne used a decoction of leaves for coals, a diuretic, and they chewed the fruit for toothache. But I'll give you a warning, those fruits, they look like a, almost like a balloon. It's an inflated round pod and there's a hard brown seed inside of that. It's about two thirds of the size of that pot. So if you bite down too hard, you might get a toothache rather than curing a toothache. Now, um, the Cheyenne, where'd the Cheyenne come from? Well, they were up in Minnesota. Then they went into South Dakota, over to Wyoming. Some of them split off, went down to Colorado and became the Southern Cheyenne. What were they doing using this plant? It made me wonder until I dove down a little deeper in some of the research and I found one more use. 
They said that an old man took this medicine and bore a child. So maybe that makes it worth going across two states to find her. Western soapberry, which is not a china berry, but the settlers called it wild china berry. Uh, the berries contain 37% saponin, which is what will make lather like a soap. When crushed and placed in water, it was used as a cleanser and a soap. But you've got to have the water because if you crush those berries up and put them on your hands, it's like washing your hands with honey. Visualize that. you got to have the water to make it lather. It can cause contact dermatitis and if you've got sensitive skin. And all the, although the berries are somewhat poisonous, preparations made by them have been used to treat fevers, rheumatism, and kidney problems. And it's commonly found across, even into the piney woods, the edge of the piney woods. It's common across Texas. Mesquite, or more properly, honey mesquite. The Apache used the juice from the leaves for irritated eyelids. Now, we haven't heard of that or seen that. They were outside all the time. You reckon they had Ray-Bans or? So they would probably have irritated eyes. So they used the bark or juice of the leaves to treat that ailment. An infusion of the bark used to treat bedwetting by children. Prickly pear, Gary's got several pads of it here tonight. The pads boiled with juice made into a tea would cure gallstones. Tender young pads split open and used as a poultice to reduce inflammation. Think about heating a prickly pear pad on a hot rock next to the fire. Scrape all those spines off. Cut that pad in half. You got a, half, a quarter inch of warm gooey mass there to make a poultice and put that on your cut or whatever you've got, wrap it with a cloth, that's a good poultice. American beautyberry, used by lots of tribes. Decoction of the roots, used by the Choctaw for dysentery, stomach ache, dizziness. Uh, decoction of the roots and berries for colic. Seminole used it for snake sickness. I'm assuming that's you know, from being snake bit, not that you're treating a, a sick snake. Uh, itchy skin, urine retention. Native Americans use the root and leaf tea in sweat baths. And look at where it grows, the eastern half of the state. You may have it here. Anybody have it on their property? Yeah. Well, it can be here. It's just not found. It was not. Some, you, someone here needs to collect it, submit it to a herbarium, and it'll be official. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, Texas winter grass doesn't show up in some counties, and you know it's everywhere. And it gets the name beauty berry appropriately because those magenta colored berries are quite showy, especially when you're out in full sun like this one is. Yopon, Alex vomitoria, so vomit. Cherokee, Alabama cushata, the creek, Natchez. Used a decoction of toasted leaves as an emetic to throw up. That made you feel better. Seminole used the bark, and the bark is not very big, pretty small, uh, pretty thin. So you want to uh, think about peeling that bark off. And they used it for old people's dance sickness, nightmarish dreams, and waking up talking. Only if those old people could tell stories. Huh? <laughs> what were they experiencing? Now, the berries, although they're real common, they weren't really used much in the literature. The leaves were what were used. And the leaves of Yopon are naturally caffeinated. So you can dry the leaves, roast them, toast them, grind them up, and you can either use it as a tea, and they used it during the Civil War as a substitute for coffee when they couldn't find coffee. So again, it's in the eastern half of the state. There are a couple of ladies down in Cat Springs, Texas, which is down near Bryan, somewhere down in there. Um, and if you Google Cat Springs Yopon, they are making and selling tea that they hand collect and dry and grind up. They put it in tea bags or you can buy it loose. So they're taking something that's it's native, but it's becoming a pest because it's so prolific and making a profit off of it. So here's a quiz. What's the native forb or native wildflower 
most utilized for medicinal purposes by Native Americans. Who's got an answer? Echinacea. Echinacea? Prickly pear? A forb now. Prickly pear would probably be considered a woody plant. Huh? Purple what? Dahlia. Dahlia? Dahlia. All right. Purple coneflower. Echinacea. Look at the uh, list. I'm going to just read the ones in yellow. Toothache, coughs, cold, sore throat, snake bite, analgesic, poison condition, snake bite, other poisonous bites, toothache, thirst preventative, dressing for burns, anticonvulsive, gastrointestinal aid, coughs, sore throat, headaches, anesthetic, mumps, thirsty or perspiring, tonsillitis, eye wash, smallpox, distemper in horses, balls, lots of uses. And it would have been a common plant. That they would have had. Look at where it's growing for the Plains Indians, especially. Now, here's something you can go and find and, and look up stuff yourself. This is from the Native American Ethnobotany website. Uh, I'll show you how to get to it. But what I did, I put in the name, and it's easiest if you search by scientific name, because there's only one scientific name. There may be a synonym that's replaced the old scientific name, but they cross reference that. But they may not have every common name that we use listed. So you type in the scientific name, hit the OK button, and 84 uses came up for this plant. You can get to, uh, if you go to the USDA plants database, just Google USDA plants database, and type in the scientific name of the plant, hit the Go button, and look down on the page, there will be a plant guide or a uh, data sheet. This is what you can get. And that whole first page is nothing but ethnobotany usage of this one plant. Second page tells you how to grow it. Good, good information. And I got a lot of this information from the main source was this Wildflowers of Texas book that you can still find. Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, Plants Database, and especially look at the, at the lower part of the page, that book by Frank Speck, 1937, Carlson and Jones, 1940, Vestal, 1953. Those books were written when they were interviewing people who were teenagers in the 1880s when the, you know, they were still widely using these plants. So that's good information. Now here's how we can, uh, I put in uh, American elderberry right here and hit okay 288 uses of elderberry that's why it's so good as a preventative and general syrup good medicine american elderberry it's probably the number one woody plant with significant uses by the native americans okay yep all right so here's how we're going to find it you're going to go and Go to Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever you use. Type in plants database. I put USDA after it. First thing that pops up, there's USDA plants database. Click on that. Here's the page it pops up. Over here on the left where it says basic search, type in your plant name. And there's a drop down right below that. It, it defaults to scientific name. If you got the scientific name, just type the name in, hit go. If you only know it as a common name, well, you can hit that drop down and, and It'll come up with common name as an option. When you type, hmm? yes, yeah, you can't have any gaps. If you say Texas winter grass and you put winter and grass as two words, it doesn't find it. It's got to be winter grass, one word. So I've typed in uh, Alex Vomitoria. Here's the first page that comes up, the general tab. Down at the bottom, there's a distribution map. It's not the one I was using, that was the bone app one. Um, Right there, let's see if it's going to go to it. There's where the fact sheet and planning guides can be found for Alex Vomitoria, Yopon. We're going to look now at the related links website, and I often go right to this link, and I look down, and where it says Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, I'll click it because it's a hot link straight to that plant on the Lady Bird Johnson site. And then I just happen to notice right below that, Native American Ethnobot. University of Michigan. And I clicked on it, and that's where I started finding lots of good information. 
When you click on it though, you get an error message saying the site has moved. And it's actually in Texas now. It's at Brit in Fort Worth. Um, so now you can uh, search, like I'm, I'm gonna type in a plant name. There's Ilex vomitoria, nine uses of that plant. Or you can go to the filtered search. We were looking for text search with the plant name. Now click on filtered search and you can search by tribes. So you can put in the Alabama, the shot of tribe in East Texas, and they use Yopon two different ways. So if you're interested in certain tribal use, there's a way to find it. And what's interesting and really good, look at that first one. Plants taken to clear out the system and produce ceremonial purity by John Sw Swaskin. I can't see it from here. 1928, look over here on the right. It even gives you the page number. That's where you can research and do some good. But look now, we've got uh, over the last, I didn't realize that Pepto-Bismol had been around 100 years, but it has. This ad is from 1971. It, and it says it outsells every breath freshener, every nose drop, every adhesive tape. It outsells 94% of all H and BA items. And I had to look that up. Yep, somebody said it. Health and beauty aids. Let's see, right there is where I need to be. Health and beauty aids. So, but look on the right, what it cures, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, nausea, diarrhea. So everybody's got a bottle of that in the refrigerator, in the door, second shelf down, probably. We've forgotten all the native plants that could be used for those same treatments. And here we've got one bottle that can treat it. So that's why our dependence on modern medicine, we've forgotten a lot of the plants, but the Native Americans have not forgotten them. And the medicine chest that they use is still out there. The plants are still there and help can still be found if we use those plants the way they did. So I appreciate your time. If we have time for questions, we're glad to take them. Thank you. Questions from the board members. Okay. Uh, because it's easy because they try to call them the anti-cancer. Right. Um, do you know why stick leaf is sometimes called chick thief? Do I know why uh, chick, stick, stick leaf? Stick leaf, Mitzilia, is sometimes called chick thief. No, I don't. But I would imagine it has something to do with that uh, sticky nature of the Velcro like seeds sticking to something and like a thief, I guess. I don't really know. Have you heard of broomweed for arthritis? Can't remember. It seemed like it mentioned broomweed um, as a treatment. Uh, the smoke, I believe, uh, putting the smoke on a broomweed to treat for arthritis. There's a lot of uses. This is just, I don't know, 40 plants or so. Uh, there's a whole lot more uses and a lot more plants out there. So go forth and start studying these plants. And maybe put them to use. Take take a Maximilian sunflower home with you. And, those, if it's going to flower now, they normally don't flower until September and October. So you could try the bathing of the flowers by midsummer. All right, I'll turn it back over to you, Beth. I want to say good night to our virtual attendees. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. There were quite a few. How many do we have on Zoom tonight? So, yeah, it's nice. Thank you.